القرية ومعظم رجال القرية يعني بيتفقوا ثقة عمياء يعني هي إمنا كلنا فلما هي حكت إنه أنا بدي أصير رئيس مجلس فالكل يعني يعني خلينا نحكي سبعة من تسعة على طول دارت لهم الفكرة إنه ليش لا الأشياء بالضر يعني مثلا نسوي لهم مناقيش نسوي لهم سبيحة نسوي لهم كب كيك نسوي لهم كرة بشار ترمس نبيعها من لبن أب مثلا شكرا الشبس والبامبا الأشياء هاي ما نبيعها بالمرة كليا ما نبيعها في هذا المطبخ انه اي ولد بيجي بده خبزه لازم تعطيه حتى يعني هو بيقول لك انا بدفع بعدين وهو بدفعش بس لازم تعطيه لاننا احنا اميات ما بصير ولد يحتاج خبزه واحنا ما نعطيه شيء رمزي يعني شيء 300 شيكل شيء اكثر شويه شيء اقل شوي يعني عندنا مثلا عندنا مثلا وحده ارمله عندنا مثلا وحده جوزها مقعد عندنا وحده اولادها بتعلم خمسه عندنا وحده جوزها بيشتغلش من هاي الناحيه كلهن اسر يعني اصلا هن بحاجه بتمنى
Hey, salam alaikum, peace be upon you. I am Samia Shoman, co-coordinator of Mecca's Teach Palestine Project. I am a longtime public school educator, mother and daughter of Palestinian immigrants. Um, that was a video of Imhesen, who I love, um, from Masada Village in Palestine. I had the pleasure of meeting her two summers ago when I fulfilled my dream um, with a team from Mecca, uh, both rooted here and in Palestine. We led a group of teachers from the United States on a learning trip uh, to Palestine. And we spent an afternoon with him, Hassan, and I got to be the translator, believe it or not, between her and our teacher group. Uh, and Hassan is a matriarch, a leader, a community organizer that among all other things like you saw in the video, make sure all village kids have something to eat that is healthy, organic and sustaining. I had the pleasure to walk through all her, her gardens. Uh, Teach Palestine exists to tell this story of Im Hassan and all the others that are constantly ignored. And we saw that actually today with the State Board of Education in the California Ethnic Studies model curriculum that was um, adopted with the deliberate erasure um, of Palestine and Palestinians. Uh, so we are very proud to be a Mecca project. We hope people continue to support Mecca's amazing work um, and teach Palestine so that we're able to continue to support Palestinians on the ground like in Hassan, um, as well as be able to tell our histories and our stories here in the United States. Um, I'm very excited to be here in celebration of International Women's Day and have the distinct honor to be in a virtual company with some amazing women. Uh, our panelists today are Barbara Ransby, Lubna Katami, and Michelle Cook. Our agenda is to have each of these amazing women speak for about 10 minutes around the challenges facing um, BIPOC women as they struggle for liberation and talk about the intersections of their struggles. Then we will have um, a panel discussion. We'll kind of um, have a conversation between ourselves, but we will also um, answer some of the questions you have. You'll be able to write questions in the Q&A so if you look at the bottom of your Zoom, you should see a little image at the bottom of your screen. Make sure during the discussion that you choose the gallery view so you can see all four of us. And then lastly, I wanna let you know that this event is being recorded and will be sent to you afterwards. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce our first speaker, Michelle Cook, who is a human rights lawyer of the Hanhani uh, tribe. Um, from the Navajo Nation. She is a Doctor of Judicial Science candidate at the University of Arizona's Indigenous Peoples Law and Policy Program. And her dissertation concerns the interse intersections of Indigenous human rights, divestment, and gender in the United States. Michelle, you know, Teach Palestine has um, been working and in collaboration with Cheeto to really highlight the parallels of Palestinian struggles with the Indigenous people to this land. So it's an honor to be in your company, um, and I'd like to turn it over to you. Well, yat a a Michelle Cook in the she Hanagahi Nishlant Bilagana Buses Chin Tobahi Dashich a Bilagana Dashinale. My name is Michelle Cook. I'm born of the one who walks around you clan of the Dene Nation, and this is how I identify myself as a Dene woman. And I'm very honored and thankful to be here with you all today, and thank you all for joining in. Um, on such an important occasion to celebrate and to discuss the liberation of indigenous peoples and how indigenous women are leading that and how, um, and how we can come together, right, as women um, for the, our liberation. <clears throat> but really, you know, today what I wanna talk about is predators, right? What is a predator? Um, and what is a predatorial energy, right? Um, there's a book called Women Who Run With Wolves. And I really think it's an important book um, for women to read and for all people to read, but especially women. Um, and there's a story in here called Bluebeard and it's all about predators. And there's a little piece in here I wanna read. It says, <clears throat> all creatures must learn that there exist predators. Without this knowing, a woman will be unable to negotiate safely within her own forest without being devoured. 
<clears throat> the Bluebeard story is invaluable to all women, regardless of whether or not they're young or just learning about the predator or whether they have been hounded and harassed for it by decades and are at last readying for the final and decisive battle with it. You know, over the past couple of years, you know, my battle has really been with what I see as the predator of the financial institution, right? That the financial institution as a whole, banks, you know, and their role in, in, in facilitating capitalism, racial capitalism throughout the world for centuries, right? As an energy, right? And uh, some people call that Wendigo, other people's call it, um, you know, the Naye, but this predatory energy, right, is something that is current and runs through so many of our movements. And, you know, we have to be able to recognize that predatory energy and those predatory institutions. And we also have to know that, you know, what is our power in fighting those institutions, right? And I think as indigenous women, right, you know, we don't have any more, we don't have weapons, right? But what we have is our heart and our light and our spirit and our truth. And what we find consistently is that 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 spirit of liberation, right? That spirit of determination and love and faith, right? Is enough to create, make indigenous peoples and women targets by these predators because that energy is so powerful. Um, and so I think, you know, when we're talking about power and liberation, you know, remember what is true power, right? And that, you know, as indigenous peoples and as all peoples, right? We also interface in a world of, of within what John Trudell called the universe of power, right? And no matter who these institutions are, right? And how much money they have and how much weapons they have, right? As indigenous peoples, we are coming with a different worldview and a different set of power. And whether they want to call that the heathen, the heretic, the witch, whether they wanna brand us with a scarlet letter, you know, we are going to be free people as indigenous people. That's the truth. And indigenous women have a very clear and loud message to all enemies of liberation, both seen and unseen. And that is that we will not be silenced. We will not be silenced. For generations, our people have fought for existence and freedom right here in this land. And we're going to keep doing that. And we need everybody's help you know, to be able to continue to exist as indigenous peoples, because all over the world, indigenous peoples are under attack and being missing and murdered, right? For doing nothing more than protecting, literally holding up the sky and the earth for humanity, the last regions of biodiversity on this planet. So our, our struggles intersect with many struggles, financial industry, the weapons industry, surveillance industry, repressive industry, state apparatus. And so there's a lot we can learn from one another. And I think my time is getting close to its end. So I just wanna say thank you for um, having me. I'm, I'm excited to hear from the other um, panelists and excited to continue to share my work with you um, in the future too. So thank you so much. Thank you so much, uh, Michelle. And we'll see you in a little bit as we engage in a discussion, um, the four of us for sharing. You know, our next panelist is Lubna Katami, who's, yeah, I consider my sister in struggle. Uh, we go way back, so it's really an honor to be uh, with Lubna in this context. Lubna is an assistant professor in the Department of Asian American Studies at UCLA. Uh, Sorry, we're so proud of her and our community. Uh, she's a co-founder of PYM, which is a Palestinian youth movement and the Palestinian Feminist Collective. She was former executive director of the Arab Culture and Community Center, which is actually where we um, formed our relationship. Uh, so Katami Lubna is also a policy member of El Shabaka, the Palestinian Policy Network. So Lubna, please. Thank you so much, Samia. It's so great to be uh, sharing this space with you. I'm really honored to be sharing the space with Michelle and with Barbara as well. And I wanna thank uh, Ziad and Jody and Penny at the Middle East Children's Alliance who have uh, always been longtime friends and just I really appreciate the work that you do so much. Um, 
I'd like to begin by honoring uh, the land of the Gabriel, Gabrielenio and Tongva people, which is where I am residing there. This is stolen land, stolen native land. I also want to acknowledge and honor the lives of the eight people who were killed in Georgia uh, uh, and acknowledge that um, that tragedy is connected to the depths of anti-Black, white supremacist, anti-Asian, racist state violence um, that has existed in this country since its inception and um, honor that uh, commitment of myself and of my Palestinian community to combating white supremacist patriarchal violence uh, in our day-to-day -day lives and organizing praxis. The question today is about the challenges faced um, by Palestinian women in our community organizing in our daily lives. And I want to start off by talking specifically about our challenges as Palestinians or as Arabs in the United States, um, living, breathing, organizing, working um, in the United States as Palestinians. Um, our struggle as women is connected to our struggle as Palestinians more broadly. We have been struggling as a people against a colonial settler colonial project that has dispossessed us of our lands, that has turned more than half of our population into refugees scattered throughout the region, um, living in squalid conditions and camps, dispossessed again by new wars decade after decade. The remainder of us continue to live under an occupation, under the boot of a formal military occupation, in the West Bank under a deadly closure uh, in the Gaza Strip and as second class citizens uh, denied full freedom, citizenship and personhood within the Zionist settler state. The remainder of us who live on the outside feel very, um, I speak for myself, oftentimes feel very, um, you know, shameful for speaking about our struggles as Palestinians in the US because our real lives our bodies, our, uh, our homes are not on the front lines of destruction, but we struggle and we suffer from the ways in which Zionism polices our bodies, our communities, even in the far diaspora, the way that we are denied entry into our homeland, the way that we are denied uh, the ability to return to our homeland, to even sometimes visit our family members, the way in which our community organizations are constantly treated as suspects, um, the way in which we are struggling against state apparatus, a state apparatus that treats us as uh, racialized subjects of suspicion. This is a constant struggle for us as Palestinians, even in the United States. Um, not only has the Zionist project removed us from our land and attempted to rewrite our history, right? Erasing us even from historic uh, registers, from historic narratives and accounts of um, the land and, and of history, but it, continues to try to repress any and all free and meaningful expression of Palestinian narratives, even in the United States. So that means our stories, our claims to our land, our claims to our freedom, our solidarity, and our relationships to one another as, as, as a people and our bonds to our homeland. So that surveillance and that repression takes, has taken form in, you know, across decades in many different ways is certainly facilitated by the United States government's um, unwavering uh, support for unabated Zionist land confiscation and dispossession of Palestinians, um, ongoing military, economic, and political funding by the United States to the state of Israel, and, and, and the development of programs uh, by the federal government here to secretly spy on, surveil, and criminalize any form of Arab-Palestinian dissent against um, the United States' relationship with Zionism and with, and with Israel. Most recently in the last decade, we have seen these repression campaigns attack student organizers who have been advocating for boycott, divestment, and sanctions. We've seen them attack um, scholars, uh, you know, intellectual scholars, writers, cultural workers for daring or having the audacity to tell the story of the Palestinian people and our aspirations for liberation and to, you know, um, to not sort of know our place, right? Um, and most recently, we're seeing it with the attack on the inclusion of Palestine in the California Ethnic Studies curriculum, which we can talk a little bit more about. But I mention all of these things to talk about the challenges of Palestinian women being part of the challenges of the Palestinian people. Um, the challenge, the struggle for freedom, for self-determination, for the refugee right of return, for the ability to live in justice 
and for the ability to heal from over seven decades of violence, of policing, of, of dispossession, uh, and, of, and of so much oppression. Um, the second scale that I wanna talk about regarding specifically Palestinian women or Palestinian feminists is the struggle of the way in which historically feminist discourses, even sometimes queer discourses, um, a lot of liberal mainstream feminism has been used and weaponized against Palestinian, the Palestinian struggle and against Palestinian aspirations for freedom. And the way that this has happened historically is you know, through a lot of colonial feminist logics, orientalist understandings of Palestinians, you know, um, very racist kind of imaginations of, 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 of Palestinian and Arab and Muslim women, um, the, the ongoing discourses that our main form of oppression is based on uh, religious dogma or is based on our cultural practices without actually attending to real structural forms of oppression, um, in which case there cannot be uh, an evasion of the question of colonialism, an evasion of the question of military occupation and imprisonment and carceral systems. Um, and so these historic liberal feminist traditions have really made it so that um, Israel's presented, uh, you know, you know, kind of buy into Zionist public relations strategies to present itself as the only democracy of the Middle East, to present itself as a woman, a champion of women's rights and a champion of gay rights, but without actually attending to the way in which Zionist settler colonialism hurts and harms Palestinian queer communities, Palestinian women, and all, and all Palestinians. Uh, and the way even in which Israel's uh, weapons manufacturing, technologies, occupation, prison systems, the way in which that they're exported and how they end up getting implemented to harm black and brown and indigenous and third world people across the world beyond just Palestinians uh, and Arab peoples in the region. So the reason I say all this is because the more and more feminism, um, liberal feminist traditions cave to Zionist pressure to exclude the question of Palestine, to exclude the question of Zionist violence and settler colonialism, the more and more it becomes difficult for Palestinian women to sort of um, be heard, right? We are constantly perceived to be passive victims oppressed by our culture and the men in our community um, and invisibilized or erased, or we are, when we speak back, we are criminalized and demonized and then painted as the, um, the excessive Palestinian terrorist woman, right? And there's very little space for Palestinian women to be heard, Palestinian women's aspirations for liberation to be respected, Palestinian women's um, you know, uh, practice in, in, in caregiving for our community, in, in political uh, and social movement building to be honored and to be acknowledged and to be named. And so I name all of this because this connects to the third um, main challenge that I and that many of my uh, Palestinian feminists and women friends experience, which is the struggle within our communities to address the question of gendered and sexual justice and freedom and um, the relationship between social liberation, social freedoms within our community um, and its connection to our broader political struggle against colonialism, right? The more and more our communities feel that feminism or our communities feel that talking about women's rights is uh, something that comes from the West or something that's imperial or something that was used to justify imperial invasions, the way that Laura Bush spoke of women's rights being used to um, justifying women's rights as the, as the reason for the invasion of Iraq and Afghanistan, right? The more and more our community develops a reaction to the, you know, an, an, an adverse reaction to the question of social liberation or feminism or women's rights. And so for these reasons that that third challenge of how does it, how can we as a community build our own self-determined visions of justice, of freedom, of the relationship between gendered, sexual, social, and political liberation in our communities, confronting femicide, con confronting violence against women, how can we do that? How can we do that when there's so much that we are shouldering and so much that we have to fight and all the fires that we have to put out and so many forms of misrepresentation that we have to combat every day. And so I mention this because that's a constant challenge that we as, uh, as Palestinian feminists are committing our life to because it is the only way we can get free. And in the process of doing that as a new generation, we are looking to our own Palestinian and Arab 
women's movement, his, women's movement histories. We are looking to the learned lessons from black indigenous and third world feminist histories who have argued for so long that there's no way to be feminist. There's no way to support women's rights. There's no way to hear women, right? Without addressing the structural violence of colonialism and capitalism and racism. And so these are the things that we are continuing to struggle with in our community. Uh, and a wonderful uh, group of Palestinian and Arab feminists I've been working with, um, the Palestinian Feminist Collective have just released a pledge this week in honor of International Working Women's Month, Working uh, Women's Month, calling for Palestine to be fully embraced as a feminist issue and to stop the Orientalist, Islamophobic, and colonial feminist narratives that continue to silence, erase, punish Palestinian feminist voices and demands and aspirations for liberation. Thank you so much. Thank you, Libna. I'm excited to kind of dig into some of the things that you shared in just a bit um, with the rest of the panel. And um, we're going to move on to Barbara Ransby, who's a distinguished professor of African American studies, gender, and women's studies in the history and history at the University of Illinois at Chicago. She also uh, directs the Campus Social Justice Initiative. Uh, Barbara Ransby is the author of many books, including the award-winning Ella Baker in the Black Freedom Movement and Radical Democratic Vision. Recently, she was named to the Freedom Scholars, a select group of academics at the forefront for of movements for economic and social justice. And I do want to take um, just a minute to, give a personal thanks um, to Barbara for authoring a letter in support of the Save Arab American Studies Coalition and our demands that other African-American scholars signed um, onto. So we appreciate you um, for that and for being um, an ally in the struggle with us. Thank you for that uh, kind introduction. It is, it is my honor and my duty <laughs> uh, to, to stand with, with my people broadly defined. Um, I want to thank the organizers of tonight's event um, and my co-panelists, Michelle and Lubna. Um, I love the title of this uh, panel, Strong Roots Moving Forward. I'm, I'm a historian by training, so I always think of the past and how we draw strength from the past, lessons from the past. We don't have to worry about repeating the past. That's not going to happen. But, uh, but we do draw lessons and inspiration you know, from the past. And as an activist, you know, I'm committed to the future uh, and committed to what this generation can accomplish, uh, but also what ground where we can lay for future generations. So, you know, this Women's History Month and this uh, International Women's History Week, if you will, it, it is an ominous moment. It is a time of, of both peril and possibility. You know, in the large scheme of things, we've experienced uh, a year like no other with a conjuncture of multiple crises um, and enormous dangers. We know the dangers, the threat of white nationalism and neo-fascism, US style. We see the continued COVID pan pandemic revealing a kind of apartheid uh, of healthcare, both in terms of within this country, but also uh, globally, and, and really the worst face of racial capitalism, that is profiteering, uh, dominating how, how and who will receive uh, the life-saving um, vaccine. In this country though, we've also seen enormous resistance in this country and around the world. But, but in this country, we've seen enormous resistance. The last, my last book was about the movement for black lives. And I had the honor to be a participant observer and sit with and march with and debate with um, an amazing uh, group of young activists, many of them women, many of them queer, uh, and they have continued to give leadership in this uh, most recent phase of struggle in the wake of the murder of Breonna Taylor uh, and George Floyd when 26 million people were in the streets protesting state violence, protesting racism. And from the very beginning, from the protests in Ferguson in 2014, we have known that, that Palestinian people, uh, the Palestinian struggle has been with us. And uh, likewise, you know, many of the uh, organizations that make up the Movement for Black Lives ecosystem have sent delegations to Palestine, have taken positions on 
uh, the liberation of the Palestinian people and have taken hits for it, quite frankly. Um, Mark Lamont Hill's most recent book, Except Palestine, you know, really outlines the kind of distortion uh, of progressive uh, uh, discourse and progressive frameworks in this country as a result uh, of people's unwillingness to take a principal stand on Palestine. My trip to um, the occupied territories in 2011 with a indigenous and feminists of color delegation was an absolutely life-changing um, experience that I carry with me uh, always. But and during these times when we have these kinds of programs, I like to hold up the names, not only of the women we know, um, and there are many, but many women we don't know. You know, Many of the young women today who are in meetings and strategy sessions and demonstrations who are braving tear gas at marches, carrying bullhorns, defying arrest, uh, experiencing harassment and death threats. These are the people who are changing the face of politics in this country uh, and looking to, to forge solidarity around the world. Young women like um, Kayla Reed and Tenjiwe uh, McHarris and Carissa Lewis and Chinieri Tudashinda and, and many, many others. I could, I could go on listing their names, Dara Cooper. Um, and they're the ones that give me hope and optimism partly because they are deeply, deeply rooted in the black freedom struggle here, but also as importantly, they are connected to, committed to, and see this struggle as a part of a larger global struggle. And when we look around the world, we see the same power, the same danger, the same solidarity, the same possibility. Uh, women in Mexico and South Africa, in, in Warsaw, uh, you know, women all over the world are Standing up this month, women in Mexico City in particular have you know, clashed with police in, in recent days and fighting against the uh, femicide in that country. But we also see our struggles as, uh, uh, as Lubna said, as a part of a larger struggle. These are not narrow, isolated gender-based struggles, but the struggle for um, indigenous women, women of color, black women around the world, uh, colonized women is a struggle for housing, it is a struggle for land, it is a struggle for self-determination, it is a struggle for our communities, our families, our people broadly defined. And to also echo Lubna, there are external struggles and then there are internal struggles in our movements, in our communities, uh, and sometimes in our families around issues uh, of gender justice. And we should not shy away from that uh, at the same time. I had some very powerful experiences this week uh, just last night, I was on a panel at Hampshire College to um, honor a friend and, and former colleague, Egbal Ahmad, who was a Pakistani uh, radical intellectual and activist. But it was a, it was a woman-centered panel, and I was on there with, uh, with Dr. Jamila Shannon uh, from Palestine and Francia Marquez, an Afro-Colombian activist uh, who is actually running for president uh, in Colombia and has been uh, really fighting issues of anti-Blackness and, uh, and struggles of indigenous people uh, in Latin America. That was an inspiring um, experience and it followed conversations with women doing work on solidarity with Haiti, uh, Black women organizers, feminist organizers in Brazil uh, and elsewhere. So as broad as we cast our net in terms of how we define who our sisters are, who our people are, uh, the stronger uh, we are and the greater potential for the greatest amount of change. I also want to echo Lubna in, um, in, in really pausing to acknowledge the vicious, misogynist, and racist murder of Asian women, six Asian women uh, uh, out of a, a larger number of eight people who were killed, seven of them women, six of them Asian women, uh, by a young man in um, Atlanta. And the media and the police have uh, held up the narrative of these women, women's killer uh, and really in the process helped to invisibilize them. They are our sisters too. We may have different uh, cultural markers and cultural lineages. We may speak different languages, um, but, but they are our sisters too. And that's critically, critically um, important to remember. So looking to the future, you know, a critical part of our struggle, particularly as feminists, is freedom dreaming. We not only want to change uh, what we're against,
but we want to envision something that does not yet exist. We want to envision a world without misogyny and violence and heteropatriarchy and white supremacy and settler colonialism. We want to envision a world where we can reimagine new forms of collective freedom, not just individual freedom to be uh, an exploiter uh, of color or an exploiter who is a woman, uh, but a different kind of system that transcends several colonialism uh, and racial capitalism. And, and that's where artists and poets and dreamers come in, you know, that really help us to imagine, to imagine big, to imagine robust, uh, uh, to imagine uh, global transformation. And I do think part of the contradictions of this moment is that a system that has seemed, um, you know, unassailable is starting to crumble at the edges. And in that dismantling, in that falling apart, we see new opportunities to build something better, more beautiful, more just, more inclusive. And that's the future I'm committed to uh, and I look forward to building uh, with all of you. So I think I'll stop uh, my remarks there and leave time for the Q&A. Uh, thank you so much, Barbara, for those remarks. And, you know, you ended by talking about freedom dreaming, which, you know, as a um, public school educator in secondary schools, I love, you know, Dr. Um, Bettina loves work and she talks a lot about freedom dreaming and education and what that would look like. So um, I'd like to thank, you know, Barbara, Lubna and Michelle, they'll rejoin me in a minute. Um, the four of us are going to talk together, but I did want to take a second to um, just going to remind you and hope you'll consider donating to support the Middle, uh, Middle East Children's Alliance and our Teach Palestine project. You know, Mecca's work helps uh, support lots of projects on the ground in Palestine um, and Teach Palestine. Uh, our project really is about supporting educators here in the U.S. and how to bring Palestine into their classroom. Um, and honestly, not because I'm the co-coordinator of the project is that so important to, um, for our project to be supported, but because I'm a mother, I'm a mother of fourth grade twins, and I want them to experience being taught, um, about who they are and where they come from in their classroom. So, um, please consider, uh, supporting Mecca and Teach Palestine. Um, I'd like to, yeah, you can see kind of the link there and we'll put that in the chat too. But I'd like um, to invite all of our panelists to come back on. I wanna thank you for sharing, right? Your stories, your experiences, your knowledge and wisdom with us. And honestly, after the events of today, I think, you know, Libna, you alluded to a little bit with the um, California State Board of Education passing um, the model ethnic studies curriculum uh, with the erasure essentially of Palestine. Um, it is not what we at least um, the writers would consider, you know, a decolonial liberatory model or framework of education. So I'm feeling re-energized um, and re-inspired to be in your company. And although I do have some prompting things um, we can discuss. I also want to invite you all um, to pose some questions and topics, but um, I want to start, you know, Michelle talked a, little, you know, a lot about the theme of power, um, and Barbara, you talked about, you know, women who we don't always see or recognize or know, um, and Libna, you talked about how, you know, in Palestine here and here, right, in our communities, women are not even though we may be at the forefront of struggle, we're certainly not seen that way. So I'm wondering if you, we can start talking about, you know, what is it like to be you in the work that you're doing? Um, how has maybe the pandemic kind of brought some of that work to the forefront, but also maybe complicated? Um, and whether, you know, you've been in this work for a long time or you're feeling kind of like you're a new guard or new leader, um, how do you honor, right, the women who have, um, you know, forged paths for us, and then how do you also create new ones? So we'll start with that. It's a big question. I know. So I'll say, you know, um, so I write about radical Black women, and um, I have written about the, the 
two main biographies that I've written, es Eslanda Robeson and, um, and Ella Baker, were people who weren't that well known. And they were kind of legendary in movement circles, but not very well known outside of movement circles. And I guess what I came to appreciate in those spaces too was they didn't feel a need to also replicate the kind of hierarchical, charismatic, individualistic models of power that they also saw in uh, men in the movement. I mean, there was a different kind of power that they leveraged. Um, so I think sometimes, you know, we it, it, bourgeois feminists succumb to this notion of, um, you know, there's one mode of power or there's one mode of organization. And one of the things I do appreciate about the movement for Black Lives here, and again, it's not perfect, uh, but there has been a resistance to um, the kind of hierarchical, you know, male-centered notions of power. When I interviewed young people in in Ferguson, for example, you know, they were very skeptical of the Al Sharptons of the world, but very receptive to the Angela Davises who came. And both of them were elders, but but they came in a different kind of way. So I think both rethinking the locus of power, rethinking leadership, and rethinking intergenerational work. One of the things that those young women said was uh, that they accepted Angela Davis as opposed to an Al Sharpton because she didn't come to, as they put it, mold and scold them. So, you know, so I think, you know, an expansive view um, of, of how we do our work is hopeful to me. And, and the second thing I guess I'll say is, you know, we come into the work that we do, and I've been doing this work over 40 years. Uh, we come in through our own experiences. Uh, I was a working class black kid growing up in Detroit. I didn't, you know, I didn't know anything about Palestine. I didn't know much of the world, right? Um, but as I came into expressing my desire for justice for my family and my community, you know, I grew from that. And I feel like it is a, a, a political maturation and evolution when we come to stand with others and define the we in bigger and bigger terms, that that's, that's the ultimate victory of liberation movements. As long as we stay in our silos, um, you know, we, we remain small. Uh, so anyway, that's, that's just some reflections on this moment. Libna or Michelle, do you wanna tackle or add something? Yeah, um, thank you so much for, you know, everyone's contributions. You know, I'm really honored to be here. And, you know, I guess, um, yeah, you know, I think something that really resonates with me, you know, is that I, you know, this recognition of, you know, how, how vulnerable and fragile the systems truly are um, and how really, how, how we're so much really on our own, I think is how, the pandemic has really shown um, us in a new light, all of us here in the United States. And, you know, to me kind of, you know, the world is becoming a reservation, right? The world is kind of becoming the way these, uh, you know, racialized juridical spaces, right? Um, of surveillance and, and policing and coercion, you know, all of that uh, Foucauldian biopower, um, you know, um, control and management. Um, really, I think, is magnified in the crisis of the pandemic and, and really shows, you know, how much inequality and really how much it seems like no one is in control, right? Um, which I believe really puts us in a position where we can dream and where we have more leverage to say, you know, we actually do have more um, ideas for the future, right? That we have to organize together, that we have to create alternatives because we've seen, right, the response to crisis. And, you know, of course, you know, with climate change, you know, I, I say, you know, COVID's going to make, COVID's going to be like a walk in the park compared to climate change, right? And so this really gives us an opportunity to evaluate, right, where we are, where our systems are, where our infrastructure really is, and, and who does that in fact benefit? Right, and so right now, the liberation of our communities on all levels is absolutely necessary for our survival. Um, and I think indigenous peoples, because of our unique, you know, uh, positionality of nations, right, and we've, we've been able to 
have this independence, um, right? But ha that has been, you know, pr um, you know, uh, interfered with through colonization. But still, you know, we have this, um, you know, desire for self determination. And so, I really feel like Indigenous peoples, in particular, are going to play a very important role in creating this alternative right to uh, predatory racial capitalism that has been, you know, the way of the world for so long. And, um, you know, in my work, what I really am trying to do is to show kind of, you know, this the microcosmic reoccurrence of the same within the financial industry, right? So that we see that, um, you know, the European financial industry really plays such a role um, in the continued colonization of indigenous peoples, lands and resources. Um, and it's basically been the same since the joint stock companies of the 16th century, right? You always need an investor, you always need capital, right? To sustain war and, and, and colonization. And so I think the more that our movements can really um, look into you know, this economic thread that binds us all um, is really important. And, you know, because it, it's the same companies that are, you know, on our border that are on, you know, within Palestine, right? It's the same BlackRock, right, is the asset manager, um, one of the largest in the world that, that facilitates, you know, um, the investment in all of these companies that create all of our problems, right? And so how can we come together and, and, and choose strategically where we can advance you know, our rights and, and uh, needs. Um, and I think one of those strategic places is within, you know, the financial industry. But again, I'm so thankful to be here and um, I really appreciate these questions. Thank you so much. Libna, did you wanna add to this conversation? Sure, yeah, I just, I really appreciate uh, what Barbara and Michelle both uh, already spoke of. I mean, I think, maybe just, I guess it's connected to both of their comments. When I think about, you know, when the pandemic began, I'm also thinking about the sort of series of crisis that led to the moment of the pandemic. I mean, we are living in a moment that is witnessing unparalleled climate crisis. We have in 2019 tipped the scales with over 70.8 million globally displaced people worldwide. We're now, especially through the pandemic, having some of the highest rates of feminicide and violence against women with so many women having to co-quarantine with abusers, right? We have been seeing just unparalleled rates of racist state violence, police killing and carceralia. I mean, we've been in a, a mode of crisis for so long, right? It, it depends on, I guess, maybe who has been experiencing it, who is close enough to have witnessed it and who has just sort of been able and comfortable enough to just kind of erase it from their consciousness because those are not the same people. But the reason I mention this is because, you know, the last four years under the Trump administration, Palestine was in a, in a place of massive crisis. We lost so much land. Trump green-lighted um, Zionist land annexation. We saw massacre of civilians in the Gaza Strip who were nonviolently protesting, including 21-year-old nurse Razan Najad, right? Who, who, who was ignored, ignored, who was just erased by feminist movements in the US. So all of our communities have been experiencing crisis for quite some time. And it is out of that experience of crisis that I think about black indigenous women of color feminist traditions, because throughout history, they have made do with what has been through the gutter. They have made life when it was not meant to exist. They have made um, third ways, alternative possibilities when everyone was policing imagination. Everyone said that there was no other way. They have made you know, homes out of homes that were reduced to rubble. And so when I think about honoring the past and moving forward, part of honoring the past is recognizing those people, those movements, those theories that allowed for things to be made when they weren't meant to exist. Um, and thinking about how, like questioning, how do we do that in our movement practice moving forward? How do we honor that legacy, but also create 
new ways um, that are relevant in the current moment. And there's a lot of things that really differ from, you know, um, our, our movement practice that we have to account for today than, than 30 years ago or 40 years ago or 50 years ago. So I, I guess that's kind of one of the ways that I'm thinking about I mean, I, I know I didn't, I, I, it's one of the ways that I'm thinking about one of the generative things of the pandemic as well. Like it, 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 it really forced people to just realize that this is not sustainable and that like life depends on, on an alternative and to really embrace the creation of an alternative, not just embrace the commitment to tearing down what already exists, if that makes sense. No, absolutely. Can I just, yeah. can I just add to, to Lubna's point I agree with you about the ongoing nature of, of, of the crises and, and, you know, I mean, in some ways in this country, you know, we sort of say, you know, poor black communities have been the canaries in the coal mine, right, that, uh, you know, have, have dealt with state violence in such acute ways. And, you know, globally, I think, you know, I mean, Palestine and particularly Gaza, you know, has been in this uh, state, of, but I do, but I, but, and maybe it's the historian in me, I do think that this is an acute moment. Um, I do think that there's, and particularly it's the issue of conjuncture, like the coming together of multiple crises. And, you know, back to, to Michelle's point about fragility, um, we look at something like January 6th, or we look at some of the outrageous desperate measures of the Trump administration, and it looks like a flexing of muscle and it's actually desperation. Uh, it's actually desperation because old ways of governing um, are less and less viable. And the climate crisis, which of course our indigenous uh, uh, family have been in the forefront of teaching us about, you know, it's a finite planet and, and, and capitalism has an infinite growth strategy and empire building is an infinite growth strategy uh, and it's no longer viable. So I think I just wanna add just maybe the proposition that there's a different level of crisis. There's an acuteness of the crisis that also creates new possibilities that weren't there before. I, I don't know, you know, it's friendly amendment. Yeah, thank you. I mean, it is interesting when you think about all of these different things you all mentioned, whether it's vulnerability of systems, global displacement, femicide, you know, being quarantined with abuse or state violence, climate injustice and change, income inequality, all of it, all these things that feel like crises. And then it's coexisting, right, um, in a world where some people have so much privilege and sometimes not so far away. And how do you make sense you know, of all of that? Um, but and as a fellow historian, I, I do think, right, we are at a moment and people will either let that moment kind of pass them by or try to excuse it, which is what we normally kind of um, see in some of our you know, more colonial systems based in institutional racism and capitalism, or we will force them to take pause. Um, and, and I really hope that's what happened. Um, but on something kind of related um, to what was brought up earlier, I want to talk a little bit about, you know, the suppression and violence against BIPOC women and even the perception, right, of BIPOC women who um, speak out, who want to be leaders, who are at the forefront on movements. Can you speak to the targeting of women both here and abroad? Right, and how do we deal with this? How is it different, right, when you're a woman doing this work in these contexts? Well, I can I can maybe speak um, if that's okay first. I I think you know I mentioned the Palestine is a feminist issue pledge, and I'm really hoping our viewers would be willing to read it and sign it and show your um, solidarity with that. Um, argument, but I think um, one of the things that the Palestinian Feminist Collective has really been thinking about is the the structural gendered and sexual violence of Zionism, right? Um, and this is, you know, this is something that Palestinian women and feminists have always been thinking about, always been organizing around and in resistance to. But it's really um, come back into into our our conversations in the last period. Um, inspired by a movement called Talat, which emerged in Palestine in 2019, that was responding to intracommunal in intimate partner um, violence and femicide of, of Palestinian women. And so then us posing this question of like, how do we understand patriarchy and misogyny and masculinist violence 
against um, against Palestinian femmes, right? How do we understand that as structural, right? And so, you know, when we when we initially launched this pledge, there's been a lot of love and support, um, but there's also been a lot of questions, some of which are sort of antagonistic and some of which are really genuine. People saying, what does feminism have anything to do with it? You know, this is about colonization. This is about land. This is about so forth. And so having to even sort of demonstrate the way that Zionism is also a project of heteropatriarchy, also a project of um, gendered and sexual violence, it, like that takes the work of our community, right? So talking about the violence against Palestinian women's reproductive freedoms, women who have to give birth to stillborn babies at checkpoints because an ambulance couldn't you know, pull through. Um, Zionist arguments about Palestinian women in the Gaza Strip during 2009, there were arguments around you know, um, demographic control, right? So thinking about reproductive freedom as um, being violated, like that is a very specific form of gendered and sexual violence. What we're seeing as sexual torture and castration and, and rape in, in under interrogation, those are very in, entrenched, not just logic, but technologies within Zionist settler colonialism. And so we want to name that because those forms of gendered and sexual violence as part of a colonial structure, they are connected to the other ways that we experience gendered and sexual violence within our communities as well, especially when we refuse to name it as, as that and to name you know, the basics of that systems of oppression can be interlocking, right? And so I think for us as Palestinians, we've always looked to solidarity to you know, women of color and black and indigenous women globally. And I think right now we're really um, thinking about the ways in which we can borrow from those movements and legacies and thinkers um, the strategies on working with our own communities um, to really, you know, embrace a, a more comprehensive um, intersectional analysis of, of our struggle as Palestinians that is not so narrowly politically defined or not so narrowly nationally defined. Um, and that actually accounts for, um, you know, uneven forms of power within our society uh, as well. So I, I just wanted to name that because I think that that's something that, um, you know, we've we don't really talk about very often. I appreciate that um, that comment. I think I would also add. I mean, I think it's always you know when when we're involved in either in the case of you know national liberation struggles or revolutionary struggles or you know a part of an, a larger oppressed community. Um, you know the question of closing ranks and, you know, in, in, in the US context, we will say, don't air your dirty laundry, um, which is to say, don't talk about internal questions within community. And while, while patriarchy and sexual violence and, and, and all that are internal, they're also external in the ways that you identify in terms of what, uh, you know, repressive states do to our bodies and our lives and our families. But it's also constructions of gender, like a, a, a a construction of a dominant notion of masculinity that even oppressed communities that men can replicate in their own cultural, um, you know, sort of with well, their own cultural sensibilities, but it's still hierarchical. It's still, um, you know, proving you're a man by dominating someone else mirrors the way colonial states, the way uh, capitalist uh, hierarchies model power and dominance, a very masculinist notion, a very toxic masculinist notion. And there's ways in which in our communities, this can be internalized. And so, you know, to sort of reject that as we fight for Palestinian liberation and black liberation and uh, indigenous uh, 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 freedom, you know, we also have to talk about ways in which we have internalized and, um, you know, not been fully critical on every way, in every way, um, of how these oppressive structures uh, impact us. I mean, you know, as we see more authoritarian regimes or when we look at the architecture of occupation, you know, we see the violent face of the state. But in some cases, the, you know, the ways in which the, the occupation occurs, the ways in which the colonization occurs is not as visible um, and manifests in the way that we relate to each other. So, um, so that's part of what we have to interrogate as well. Yeah, thank you. Um, 
you know, for that, it is interesting when you think about, right, like our internal dynamics within um, our various, you know, groups that we work in within or our society or our cultures, right, and then in the external. Um, and so I want to move to that a little and, and talk about kind of how how do you navigate the internal and external, right? Especially when we know navigating, right? External poli um, politics in this country of institutional racism, colonialism, white supremacy. Um, and then, you know, the last four years of what we faced with that presidency. But then there's also, right, the internal. Um, and how do you do that? And try and stay true to liberatory uh, framework rooted right in decolonialism and solidarity. Um, I, I just keep thinking about today, you know, and what happened, and seeing people even of our own communities, like who say they represent right certain communities, and then are not aligned really with um, the ideas of um, a decolonial um, education rooted in liberation and solidarity. So can you talk um, a little bit about that, the internal, navigating the internal and external? Well, maybe I'll start this time. Michelle, did you wanna? Okay. Um, you know, I mean, I think, you know, I mean, I'm very much a feminist. I'm an anti-capitalist. Uh, uh, I um, am an internationalist. Um, but also I understand the limits of what gets termed identity politics. Like all women are not for all women, right? There are women who collaborate with the system of patriarchy. There are, I mean, you know, we have Clarence Thomas on the Supreme Court. Clarence Thomas is phenotypically black, grew up as a dark skinned, poor black man in the South. Like everything pointed to him having a different kind of politic and a different kind of consciousness and it ain't there. So, um, so I think, you know, beyond assuming that identity or social location or culture will determine politics. I mean, it, it doesn't, and this has always been true. So, um, you know, while our experiences, our identities inform and, and sometimes inspire and motivate the work that we do, they don't determine it. And so we're gonna always have, you know, um, you know, Palestinians who are not fighting for Palestinian liberation, black people who are collaborating with white supremacy, women who reinforce and mimic patriarchal practices. So, so that's kind of question number one. But then question number two is how do we engage in principled struggle? How do we approach our work with a level of humility that we can change our minds, that we can, you know, admit our own vulnerability? You know, I, I think, you know, one thing for me sort of around the question of, of disability justice in our larger movement, something that often gets left out of our list of um, systems and ableism is an, is an enormously powerful system. And, you know, some uh, folks writing about uh, settler colonialism have talked about this as well. Um, that notion of uh, the, the perfect human doesn't allow for a, ver a deviation from you know, what that ideal, which is often white and uh, male, you know, it doesn't allow for any deviation from it. So anyway, so I think walking with humility into the work is one thing, but also understanding that there are going to be people on the other side, that people make choices, um, even though we want the people who look like us to be our people, um, they, they, they are not all making that choice. So that's, you know, that's what we have to navigate as well. And, and, we can, and we can get ourselves in a lot of trouble if we don't do that. I mean, I think, you know, in this country, you know, now we've had Barack Obama as, pre we had a black president who did not, um, in my opinion, act in the best interest of many people, um, Palestinians, black people and others. Uh, so we see that representation does not liberate us. Movements liberate us, a set of politics and values and ideas will help to liberate us and strategies uh, and courage will liberate us. Moral courage, political courage um, will liberate us. So even when we see individuals who disappoint us or are self-serving, um, we have confidence in the bigger we. Yeah, thanks. Uh, Michelle Libna, do you wanna add or comment on that? This idea of you know internal and external 
um, and navigating that? You know, I think, you know, that's a hard question because, you know, for example, you know, my mom is a boarding school survivor, right? She was uh, taken from her home when she was a young girl and put in a boarding school. And so we also have to remember that that internalized colonization that we're seeing among our people, right, has been done so through violence, right, has been done so through violence. And the body in the blood remembers the violence, right? If you look even at Europe, right, you know, and the process of violence that was required and necessary, right, to create the empire for Rome right, the witch burnings, the persecutions, the inquisitions, right, the incredible torture apparatus, right, that was required to remove any kind of opposition, right. Um, one of our first human rights defenders, uh, Metacomet, right, of King Philip's War, he was quartered, right, and um, his, his, his body was sent to the four corners of the British Empire. Right, and he was our first human rights defender here in the United States. And so you think about that kind of repression, right, being quartered, watching someone be beheaded, seeing their head on a pike being placed in, in, in Plymouth, right, to remind everyone, if you rise up ever again, this is what's going to happen to you through violence, by and through violence, right? And, and that is the, the system, right? That this whole system is based on coercion and violence, not consent, not true power, right? True power is, is, to, is, is somebody doing something because they want to, because they believe in it, not because they're forced to, right? Through violence. And so this, this system is very much about, you know, the domination coercion of the body and mind. And so, you know, with, with our people, who have struggled and have, have had to go through forceful assimilation, right? I have a lot of forgiveness for my people, right? I have a lot of forgiveness for my people, um, despite all of the flaws, right? Despite all of the ways in which our people have been harmed, despite all the ways in which our people are not perfect, right? They're still my people. They're still my relative, no matter how broken. And, and a lot of that brokenness and trauma and self-hatred, right, is because, is because of that system of violence, you know, and it's purposeful. So that's how I, I relate to it, right? And so when I see that kind of attitude, you know, I see that system. And I think the best way that we respond to that is through love and through compassion and through the embodiment of our original law, of our original matriarchy, of our originality as indigenous peoples as the alternative, right? To try to embody that forgiveness, to try to embody that love and that nurturance, right? Because the, the healing really is through love, right? As, as maybe as, as non-academic as that sounds, right? Um, and I admit that, you know, it sounds, doesn't sound very academic or fancy, but it is, I believe that love and that heart and that power right, is, is the power of our movement. I believe that that heart is the power, the antidote against the predator. Um, and so I accept the brokenness of my people, right? And I, and I pick them up and I love them because it's also accepting the brokenness of, of myself, right? And so I accept myself, I accept the imperfections, I accept the ways in which colonization has impacted me, right? And I want I want that healing in my own spirit and heart to be free. And I want all people to, for, for that to be free too, right? Um, and I think, you know, understanding that history of violence allows us to kind of have a little bit of compassion for, for some of that lateral violence. But again, I think, you know, uh, there's also freedom of association. If I get too much lateral violence, I just, uh, you know, go play in a different um, play in a different place, you know? And, and with people who love and support me and who, and who inspire me, right? And I think, you know, gravitate to the people who, who support you and love you and want to push you forward and focus on the positive, focus on your team, right? And, and, and just try to block out the rest of the noise. You know, that's how I try to handle it. Yeah, thank you. I, I appreciate so much of, you know, what you're both 
you and uh, Barbara talked about it's very, you know, fairy, I'm a frarian, right? Um, movements definitely will liberate us, not a person or persons. And, you know, that idea of love and thinking about, you know, why, right? He talks even about thinking about why did the oppressor become the oppressor? And, you know, what are their actions and how do we treat that? So, you know, um, I don't know that we always need to feel like we have to be so academic or intellectual, you know, all the time, but that idea of, you know, love and acceptance. So um, thank you so much for sharing that. Uh, Libna, did you want to add anything um, before we get some of the questions that are being posed by um, our attendees? Yeah, I, I mean, I just want to start off by just saying, like, thank you, Michelle, for talking about, you know, you know, it, it, I know that love sometimes is interpreted as like, that's not like the overt political, but honestly, forgiveness and love for our families and communities and people and acceptance of them through all of their flaws and all of their brokenness and all of the sort of ways that we have felt injured or, or harmed by them, I think is a very radical act. And I think it's very hard, right? And I don't wanna romanticize it about being very revolutionary or very, you know, it's a very hard thing to do. Um, and I think that it's a, it's, it's a, it's a really important necessary um, component of being able to sustain our commitment to our collective communities, because if we don't have that, we would, you know, we will, it, 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 I just can't even imagine how we can sustain our movement practices without it, right? Um, I do wanna say that one, one thing that I think, well, back to the question of navigating the internal and the external, I think we're in a in a strange moment where I don't know if it's because of call out culture or if it's because of the neoliberal normalization of like multicultural um, ideas, but there is a very um, persistent form of like ridding ourselves of responsibility around systemic forms of oppression by demonstrating our wokeness like through social media or demonstrating what we're condemning or what we're against or what we're not down with making sure like I think that people feel a lot of anxiety about needing to say something or acknowledge something or recognize something um, in order for them not to be perceived as a sexist or as a racist or as a whatever and I think that in many ways politics of recognition and politics of acknowledgement you know, they're important in, in a lot of ways and they've moved a lot of people. They've been an introductory thing for many people who have moved even further. But I also think it comes oftentimes without a real material commitment to how to um, practice our lives differently so that we are not complicit in racist or sexist or colonial subjugation, right? And I think that this is something that for me, when I'm thinking about the internal and external, I try to remind myself that it's less important to be concerned with discourse for the sake of discourse or statements or, or words put out for the sake of words and more so like trying to maintain the commitment to a different kind of practice within our communities, right? I'm not really interested in my community putting out a really politically um, beautiful statement if we haven't been doing the work to build the capacity, and I mean all forms of capacity, financial, political, emotional, mental health, like strengthening our community to really shoulder it, to really embody that politics. And I think that that's something um, that a lot of movement uh, community spaces are, are really struggling with. Like how do we build up our people and our collective capacity to move together in movement and to, sh and to really be able to shoulder the responsibility of, of the politics that we're, we're putting forward, um, you know, in our writings or in our statements or in our discourse. And I think that that's a, a struggle that a lot of us are still going through. Yeah, thank you for bringing that up. And I think that's been, you know, a struggle for a long time, right? So um, I wanna appreciate you all entertaining, you know, these prompts that I brought up um, and addressing those and talking about them as we talk about, right, um, BIPOC women's work in this area. I wanna to turn to some of the questions posed by our participants, if that's okay, in the last 15 minutes we have. And so the first one, Libna, you, mentioned um, right now, social media. So the question is, um, I'm troubled by the ways that social media commodifies social justice activism and feminism. 
I don't intend to pass negative judgment on any individual's use of social, social media as a tool uh, for social connection or expression. The question is, can you talk about the role and value of social media in the struggle for liberation and abolition? I mean, I can say something about that. Um, I'm probably the oldest person on this panel. So, you know, we often think of, you know, social media as kind of this generation's media domain. But I mean, I, I think social media, if we fetishize it, you know, it's, um, it, it's, it is a tool and it's a tool that, you know, often is uh, perpetuates a lot of negativity, you know, the whole you know, thing about cancel culture, et cetera. And, and people also hide behind, you know, a certain layer of anonymity to attack people and lots of negative things happen. And of course there's trolling and there's, there's, there's a lot of kind of sabotage of honest discussion and debate. On the other hand, it also allows for a level of communication, you know, that, uh, that we have not had before. I mean, uh, unfiltered with all of the dangers and all the potential that come with that. So, so I don't think it is in any absolute way one thing or another, uh, but, but it certainly, you know, has, has been used by both the right and the left. It has been used even within progressive circles in a positive and a negative way. I think some people misconstrue, um, you know, uh, comrades and, 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 and a base with followers uh, and, and, and just having a lot of followers doesn't mean that you've actually built unity with people um, struggled and learned from and, you know, sacrificed with. So, so that's, there's that. On the other hand, you know, the dis distribution of images of police violence, the, um, uh, the use of social media to uh, carry information from one part of the world to another. Now states are increasingly shutting down social media, you know, in Burma now and, um, you know, a, a number of other places on the planet. Turkey has done it. Um, so, so it's not absolute, it's not absolutely democratic, it's not absolutely in our hands, but I have certainly seen it as a positive uh, a tool. But I also just, just wanna add a footnote to the previous discussion about, you know, about love and forgiveness. I mean, one of the things that I'm very hopeful, and I still think we have a lot of work to do digging deeper around what is abolition, what does it mean? People use it, I mean, one word does not explain itself. There's a, there's a larger, um, you know, kind of politic and practice around it, but um, but it does embody that notion of forgiveness and not throwing anybody under the bus. And you know, I've taught for you know a number of years off and on at a local uh, prison here, and you know, my students are incarcerated, and all of that has really um, helped sensitize me to the wholeness, you know, of their humanity. I mean, even though I have the political commitment to decarceration just that experience, which most people don't have um, of having relationships with people who are incarcerated, you know, pushes us toward understanding the wholeness uh, of people in our communities who have admittedly done horrible things, done horrible things, but still, you know, um, our, our people still have other aspects of who they are, have remorse, have you know, contributions to make and, 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 and shouldn't be uh, relegated to cages for, uh, you know, for, for the rest of their lives. Anyway, just that came to mind when you were talking, both Lubna and Michelle. Thank you. I don't know, um, Lubna or Michelle, if you wanted to add anything to that. No, okay, so let's go to the next question, which is, um, can you share recommendations for reading about how disability connects to the issues you're discussing? Um, I don't know if you have any off the top of your head, or maybe we can chat them in. And I know- Yeah, let me uh, put them in the chat. That'd be great. And Barbara, I know someone else had asked early on when you were mentioning some of the names around, you know, um, there's lots of women, right, who we don't always know or talk about. Somebody asked, you know, if you can put some of those names in as well. Um, the next I'll in the chat, cause I've been speaking a awesome. lot of this. Thank you. Um, the next question says anyone who stands for justice for Palestine gets accused of anti-Semitism. How do you respond to that charge? Um, does it even deserve a response? I, yes. Let me, I, I, 
can talk a lot about that, right? Um, but do you want to take a, a pass at it? Uh, I would love to, and then, you know, I would love to hear other, other people's thoughts. I mean, I think I tried to maybe start my talk off with this, but I'm, I'm not going to lie. I've been on zoom calls all day. So I was a little rusty in the beginning, but, um, I think this is what I, I meant in the beginning when I talked about just how hard it is to just be Palestinian in the United States. Um, like, you know, it, it's it's just like these very subversive ways. Like you say Palestine, someone else says back to you Pakistan. That you say Palestine, someone says, oh, you mean Israel. So there's just this constant like explaining constant. Yeah, you know, And those are those kind of soft ways that like our entire political history of like why we even are in the United States in the first place gets brought up in these like very casual quotidian interactions. But then, you know, when it really does come down to us asserting collective aspirations or narratives, whether it is in the academy, it is through student movements, community movements, um, the way in which anti-Semitism, accusations of anti-Semitism are used to stifle dissent, are used to you know, eliminate any kind of public intellectual debate, real rigorous historical debate, it's just so exhausting. And I think that you know, a lot of our communities, we respond because for us, we recognize that Zionism's power is in its corporate wealth and in its state power. But we also understand that we as Palestinians, we have the moral integrity of our cause and that anyone who knows the history of our struggle will ally themselves with the Palestinians if they are doing it on the basis of, you know, the moral integrity of a struggle. And that is the reason why I think Palestine has found a really beautiful home in struggles for social justice, racial justice, you know, gender and, and sexual liberation, because there are those connections already. And so that's those are the places that we find community. Those are the places that we can can actually really do creative thinking and learning together about our, you know, different causes differences, similarities, and so forth. But I do think that we put up the fight around, you know, explaining that anti-Zionism is not the same as anti-Semitism because a lot of the time it's the way that we understand it's the least we can do in our, you know, in our location on Turtle Island, right? Like we're, it's the least, it, we feel like it's this political responsibility, right? To, to, to make sure if we can't achieve anything else to make sure that our cultural practices, our narratives, our histories stay alive for ourselves, for our future generations, and for our communities and friends that we're a part of um, here. Thanks. Yeah, I, uh, I love Palestine so much that I named my daughter Palestine, which means, you know, in Arabic Palestine, and I'm waiting for her to sit in a classroom and somebody say, you know, what does your name mean? It means Palestine. What are they going to do? Tell her she doesn't exist. She's sitting right there, um, you know, or that they're offended by her name. Like, you know, people have complained about classrooms that have a flag up uh, as someone, right, who's been targeted and called anti-Semitic for trying to teach, you know, about Palestine or include Palestine um, in curriculum. So, you know, I, I think we pick all different ways to kind of pass our leadership and instill strength and resilience um, in our kids when, you know, when and if we have them. That's one way I have chosen um, to pass that on. We have a few minutes left and there is one more question um, that was in um, the chat that you can answer. And I'd also like to see if we have a minute, if you just have one closing thought um, before we finish up. I can't believe all the time went by already. Um, I've learned so much tonight and feel so honored to be in your company. And the question is, can one of the pal uh, panelists speak to the struggles of queer communities in Palestine? I don't think I'm the best person to do that. I mean, we, you know, we we met through. I mean, Lena O'Day, who is like my second daughter, who's in the in the chat now, um, introduced us to some amazing young activists during our delegation. Um, uh, you know, in 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 uh, Palestine, and just 
you know, I mean, viewing queer politics and gender nonconforming politics in the context of struggling for the liberation of Palestine, but also then having to fight for their right to be in the struggle, which is true in this country as well. So um, I'm, I'm not an expert, but I, as a feminist, appreciated, appreciated their politics and, their, and, and, and what they were teaching us. Yeah, I would just say, um, recommend to folks to follow El Caos, uh, which is in Palestine. I'm doing a lot of really great organizing work, community and social, social and political community building in Palestine and globally, but also has really provided a lot of um, really essential materials in both Arabic and in English to talk about, um, you know, the, the way in which Palestinian queer communities are impacted by Zionist settler colonialism, but also the way in which Palestinian queer communities are, you know, struggling and a part of and navigating uh, broader experiences of exclusion and silencing um, within our own within our own communities. And yeah, thank you for um, naming that organization. We got lucky to visit with some representatives from that group when we um, took our teachers to Palestine, right? As another way. Um, Libna, can you put that in the chat for us, please? Um, so it was another learning opportunity. Okay, we have just um, a last few minutes. So I would love if you each um, can just take, you know, a minute or less to um, maybe just give a closing, you know, remark around um, our topic tonight, you know, moving forward, right? When we think about um, what our theme was for um, this evening, what's important, right? As we move forward. It's a pressure to say something profound in closing, right? Oh, not necessarily. <laughs> I'm taking in. I'm I'm taking in the whole panel. No, I mean I think solidarity work is 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 hard, and um, you know it is always about expanding the we and understanding um, you know understanding our own positionality, but also embracing a larger and larger political family. That that is how I see it. Um, so you know that that is my goal in the work now and the years ahead. And I'm, it's, I'm leaning into optimism um, about the world that we will see and that our children and grandchildren will see. Thank you. As a mother of you know, young kids, I have twins, they're 10. Um, I appreciate that optimism and it helps me um, to remember, right? And reminds me to be optimistic. Um, Michelle, uh, and then Lubna maybe. Um. I think, uh, you know, I guess I'll, I'll leave saying, you know, what we think is what we manifest in this world. What we dream is what we create. That's how powerful we are, truly. And each and every one of us has that much power, right? To, to manifest the world through our breath and our mind and our, and our action and our prayer, if you will. And um, so, you know, rem remember how powerful you truly are um, as a people, you know, um, and it's important not to give up, right? You know, right now it's such a difficult time for so many people. And um, I remember the words of uh, LaDonna Braple Allard, who was one of the um, founders of the uh, Standing Rock uh, movement, the sacred camp of sacred stone. And uh, she said, you know, uh, we are, we're like the buffalo, right? And we, we stand and face the storm like the buffalo, right? And the buffalo, they, in, in those areas, you know, they, they withstand, you know, storms of like negative 50 degrees and they're out there, you know? And in times of, you know, hardship, you know, when we're under so much pressure, right? Um, in all of our work, you know, to find that calm center of, peace, right, to face the storm and to have that faith, right, that um, we are going to pull through all of this together as we have in the past, right, to remember our ancestors, all of our ancestors who, who brought us here are with us in this universe of power. So, you know, no matter what comes, no matter what we are facing, all of us, right, and the monsters we're facing, we're here at this time, right? 
to be here at this time for a reason. And so to trust yourself, right? To trust your voice and your spirit and your heart and your contribution, right? And, you know, I have faith that all of us together, you know, having these conversations together, that's how we're going to build, you know, a future in peace, secure world for ourselves. So, you know, um, all of us together, you know, we can, we can chant down this Babylonian system, right? That's how powerful our prayer is. And we just have to continue to believe in ourselves and continue to come together and unite, right? When we're separated, like fingers, you know, we're not strong, but when we come together, right, all as one, we can accomplish anything that we put our minds to, anything that we put our minds to. Yeah, thanks for expanding on that idea, right? Like Barbara, you know, says around expanding the we, right? Um, and I love the idea of, you know, reminding ourselves that what we think is what we're manifesting um, in this world and that we need to continue to face the storm, you know, because it's not going to get lighter, but we will continue to be stronger. Um, one minute, Lebanon, the last minute that we have before we have to close out, any last thoughts? Yeah, thank you. Thank you, everyone, for joining. And um, those, Michelle, those words were just like so beautiful to end, end with. I just want to maybe add on one thing, which is that, you know, there's an obsession with the question of individual rights uh, in the current moment. And I think that it's just always important for us to go back to understanding what collective freedom means, right? But for our own communities and for our communities in solidarity and in relationship with the earth and with other communities. And I think that going back to the question of freedom dreaming of like revolutionary imagination is so important. And I just, you know, there was this quote that um, Adrienne Marie, Marie Brown said uh, last year at the American Studies Conference. And she said that this is a um, imagination battle. And that if, if we think of of it that way, then we just have to question who is it that imagined this world, knowing that like, if we can imagine something else, come together to imagine something else, that it is something that we can manifest. I think, you know, really um, kind of just paralleling what has already been said. Um, yeah. Thank you for sharing that. May we continue to freedom dream um, and expand our we. I'm so honored to have been in your company um, this evening and to really celebrate, right, and um, put the voices of BIPOC women at the center. So thank you. I want to thank all of our participants um, for being here this evening, right? We all know there's a lot going on. So thank you for coming. I want to thank the Adela Justice Project for co-sponsoring this event. And again, um, remember, you can support Mecca by going to www.meccaforpeace.org. Have a good evening, everyone. Thank you so much. Thank you, Samia. Have a good night.